Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9.11. And of course, we're playing as Japan. This will be episode 3. Um, okay, I want to comment on a few things. I'm really loving uh, discussing a lot of you with a lot of you about um, this upcoming uh, series. A lot of good advice going back and forth, some of which I'm taking, some of which I'm not. Doesn't mean I'm not, because I'm not taking it, I, not that I don't think it's good, it's just, I don't know. Um, I made one significant change, um, made mostly from talking to Darkstar, I believe his name is, um, on difficulty settings, because I did have to replay through, and we're now at February 1, at loading a save. So that's all work, both the auto save and my save. Um, you know, manual save both worked. So hopefully we were, were cruise on through with all this just fine. We are playing again, just to let you know, no sub mods. This is straight black ice with just the, I think the only thing I is left over is not from when I super reduced it, but when I've reduced it down um, the fort fortification levels in the um, EULA defines file, it's somewhere between standard and black ice black ice is harder than standard fortification levels you know um you know, meaning for each level of fort how hard it is to attack or whatever you, the fort levels themselves everywhere are the same it's just the difficulty per level of fort is somewhere between about i think about midpoint what is standard um hearts of iron 3 and black ice that's the only real change there so taking forts is a little easier but it goes both ways it's you know the enemy taking my fort um but from the advice um is decided to change and have germany on hard instead of normal um his advice was um based on um germany they think and see I I know I'm digressing more I've almost never played as anything but Germany I mean any length of games one it comes down to one game uh, as Britain and one game as Italy that's it um, Germany was doing pretty well um, in the game as um, uh, Italy uh, versus the Soviets I for you can go back and look and I'm sure um, I cover the, the settings for Germany and the Soviet Union and whatnot in that game. But, um, and it got to the point that Germany was doing okay, but the Soviet Union was kicking um, Italian butt in Turkey. So, um, and there were newer, better versions of Black Ice out, and I wanted to get over and play. The German series is sort of some of the reasons I stopped that now. The thought is, is that this is going to be too easy for me. Um, and this is from some of the people who've watched, uh, you know, a fair amount, not everything, but a um, fair amount of some of my stuff. And I don't know, because I've never really played as Japan. I have started up, I hadn't, didn't have any of the crashing problems until I started doing the recording. And recording, running my recording software while doing this takes up more processor usage and other things. Um, so it's just putting more stress on the system. That is why I think I've had, especially in the last series, more difficulties maybe than you might, um, with your system and your game. Um, thought that it would be just too easy for me to win. And they may be right. Um, like I say, I have never really played, oh, oh, I'm going through it. So I played through you know the first six months first eight months or something of 1936 is japan a few times in different difficulty settings just sort of quickly to um see how things go but beyond that kind of stuff so i sort of have the few events and a few things coming up um here sort of a little bit of forewarning of what's going on but beyond that i've never played a game as japan and so they're thinking as, as I'm just going to kick butt and it's going to very quickly become in, uninteresting to watch. And it may. I'm not expecting that. Um, I've commented before. 
that in um, games playing as Germany, I've had to come and bail out Japan um, from U.S. invasions, and I had to, and I started out by sending over, you know, some of my sort of favorite light infantry and mountain type divisions because, hey, Japan's mountainous, light infantry, thought that would be good, but they couldn't even stand against some of the American stuff, and I had to bring send over... Um, this was a game in which I was kicking butt everywhere, basically invading Britain, but Japan was a, still held much of, you know, its possessions, but the U.S. had directly invaded it and I was about ready to lose at least the home islands, and I figured that would um, trigger, and they had actually lost Tokyo, I think, in that game before I got there. I had to send in heavy panzer divisions, you know, with, um, you know, heavy panzer battalions or something like that in them to be able to stand and, and defeat and push the Americans out in that one game way back when. So that's some of my expectations is that when facing mid-late war American heavy division type stuff, you know, armored divisions, uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, successfully push against that. That's my expectations. So what I'm looking at doing is, yes, having island garrisons, but mostly this. Now maybe we will sort of do the historical thing and put some um, fortification levels, you know, on, on Iwo Jima and places. And hopefully when we early stages of the war with the U.S. be able to take places like Guam. The reason U.S. has Guam and still has Guam to this day um, is because, not because of American imperialism. No, we went to war with Spain. Um, basically, that was a press um, ginned up war. You notice how the press, who always claims to do, I want to do um, peaceful, they always seem to gin up wars in America. I don't know if the rest of the world understands that. Now, the press, because the modern, modern American press is wars that are um, against America's interests that America goes into are good things, but wars for America's interests, they're just blood for oil type things, meaning go into Libya to kill Gaddafi, that's good, but don't go after Saddam Hussein, that's bad. Crazy stuff, but they gin up wars. Um, there is the um, Spanish-American War, sort of over a ship, the main, blowing up in um, a, a Spanish port in Cuba. Um, it probably was a um, magazine um, accident in that um, bad ammunition handling or something blew it up and sunk it. There is, it was, you know, as a U.S. ship on a port visit. There it was at the time um, lots of suspicion that it was Spanish sabotage. And that gets us into a war with Spain. And Spain was at that time sort of the last real sort of aggressive um, European power really trying to hold possessions in America. Yes, you had Britain and still Belize, but Belize was just a teeny little nothing of a thing. And yes, um, there are still, like, um, uh, Curaçao here is still Dutch territory, and there are still some, um, well, they're, I guess, Commonwealth British, and I don't know if any of the stuff. Um, France still has um, here, French Guinea here, but... Um, uh, these are now independent, and so, but they were at the time, uh, you know, at the time still Britain, obviously um, 19th century Britain was not a power America could go to war with, and France probably wasn't either, but there was a very strong independence movement going in Cuba at the time as well uh, against Spain, and so we went to war, the US went to war with Spain, and also it included, um, the U.S. attacking Sp Spanish-owned um, the Philippines. And the Philippines, um, well, Cuba got its independence. In sure, it was, you know, a semi-American puppet state. Nothing like, shall we say, um, Manchukuo was for Japan. You know, a, there's puppet states and there's puppet states. Um, the Philippines was a... Um, Never U.S. territory, at least as my understanding of it, but was um, governed by the U.S. And I think it was 
45 or 46 it was scheduled for many years you know they had you know it was it was a 19th century war it was like for i don't know 45 years or, or something uh scheduled to be a um sort of a u.s administered maybe sort of possession but not um that was going to schedule to get its independence after a certain amount of time now guam still is a u.s um possession but then again it's guam people you know it it's really not even um terribly viable for for tourism um out here it's just so far away it's a long fairly long flights to go out to hawaii and that's probably other than you know romantic bali and tahiti and a few other places you know that has a little bit more um tourist value some of these nations out here are or and some are nations now but um some of these islands out here just are really you know hardly viable countries and, and when i say that and you can go oh yeah they've got you know culture and peoples and their own little seat in the u.n yeah but about um 50 well-armed mercenaries from some from anywhere decides to want to have an island paradise can come in and take over those some of these um, countries out here it's only the general international community that would step in and um, stop it, let alone um, say, oh, I don't know, an aggressive China might come in and decide to to swallow up um, some of these countries. And if you think, oh, Chinese isn't, aren't imperialist, blah, 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 blah. Um, just wait until they have a um, some sort of national debt because they sign on board with China to build some new harbor or some massive indoor uh, air conditioned mall or I don't know what and default on their payments and then China decides to come in and take over to to do some of that kind of stuff so yeah um, they are really to this day not a viably defendable nation you know in that sense and of course yes always big superpowers can take over or, Great powers can take over minor things, but still, eh, you have a lot more trouble taking over the Philippines. I mean, China can do it, theoretically, but a lot more trouble. Okay, so um, off on all that tangent. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so, um, based on um, Dark Star's advice, I've gone and when I replayed this and had Germany on hard, normal Soviets. Italy on normal so that Germany hopefully won't be too easy to take down because I know that if Germany and presumably by that point Italy goes away we're going to face the complete wrath of the Allies and they're going to um, just be able to kick our butt if it comes down to that um, point um, now long-term or plans yes i think i'm going to be able to defeat china never done it before as you know hearts of iron 3 japan but i think i am i can watch the ai do it so i see if the ai does it i presume i can do it i don't know how hard and i do have it on settings of hard where normally i just have that on china on normal i believe so as not to give japan too much trouble because if Japan is focused on a troublesome land war in um, China, well, it looks like communist China may go away. Good, interesting, um, if they do. Um, if it's focused on that, and then via events, decisions, and whatever else, Japan goes to war with the rest of the world, Japan can just really be um, overrun and that it... The AI in cannot seem to and this is probably also holds true for hearts of iron 4 as well but cannot seem to prioritize well enough to go oh well let's grab all of the sort of you know valuable provinces and go on the defensive here and try to you know go on the offensive in other places where it can win you know um 
doesn't seem to be able to sort of do that well enough. So to just keep pouring more and more and more resources into China, trying to win there while still at war with the U.S. and Britain and other places and getting overrun. Um, so, but I do have hard China on this. Now, as I was saying earlier, um, I'm not planning on fighting out these battles as, um, you know, stacking up. This does have some level of coastal for it. We may build a few pillboxes and things. Um, uh, you know, some sort of desperate hard fighting and putting troops in to oppose um, American landings. My plan is to use naval and air power to sink, destroy the American fleets. That is my plan. And to have some, yes, some garrison elements to force them to have a real significant invasion fleet or invasion force. And then once they do that, then they can overrun it if we can't stop it with um, uh, naval and air power. But force them to as opposed to leaving them unoccupied or, under, you know, unfortified at all. So we will be throwing in some levels of forts if there aren't already and some levels of anti-air and things like that, just to make sure that it is a, a level of difficulty uh, to do so. And, um, you know, move down and take, prob probably try to take Australia at some point. Yes, Tippett, we will probably take your home country. And we may lib liberate, take temporary possession of India or something like that. We will see. Um, again, that's a very much we will see. And would like to now I don't ex uh, oh hey if I can get in and de de destroy some fleets and find um, Hawaii you know with only limited defenses oh boy you better bet I'm going to go in there and I may very well may take that um, that kind of thing I don't think I don't believe like I was saying from previous experience that my divisions will be able to move in and take on American divisions and defeat America. And I don't envision a successful Germany being able to do so either. Meaning, if we come around to 1945 and Germany is holding most all of Europe and, you know, do, do, doing well, I don't envision them ever, you know, um, invading and taking America. They may but I don't envision that. So it would come down to me to take it, and I don't think, no matter what I do with the, the Japanese army, it's ever going to be able to defeat the what is normally at home. Uh, it doesn't mean I can't, um, again, theoretically, quite likely, more more likely come via like Alaska and into Canada um, and take some ports. But I think we would find uh, eventual U.S. just um, returning the favor and pounding me, you know, pounding whatever force. That's my expectation. And so at that point, probably the series will be over once we've tried to do a land invasion. That's presumably if we're being successful and failing. But if for some reason I am able to, and this does turn out to be, and this has been a long ways getting here, I know, um, defeat the U.S. on land on a major continental thing. What I want to see about doing is at that point is once we get there is to see if I can go in and um, edit, mod things a little bit um, s sort of that at that one point to make sure that Japan and its allies leave a, um, the faction with um, Germany and I'm not sure this is just a, a what if go for a man in the high castle type scenario of war between uh, Japan and the European Axis powers because I'm presuming if Germany's done so well Italy and some of the others will still be around um, again I think that is unlikely so if you're looking for that man in the high castle thing and expecting it to happen, I think it's going to be very unlikely. But if it does turn out, that is sort of where I want to move this in the long term. If I were to do this 
and for a German series, if we say in the last German series I didn't have that unpassable um, load game problem. This is the bug is can't load the game. Um, and Germany takes down the US, which I fully anticipated to be able to do, though I didn't know if I was going to play that long. That makes Germany just so uber-powered, so overpowered that um, fighting a war with Japan is just an exercise in doing so. It's not a challenge. Where Japan, which might, by the time it's defeated the U.S., have some tank divisions, they probably aren't going to be nearly as numerous, nearly as effective as the German ones, and those kinds of things. And this is why um, we've got some decent... I sees now that we've picked some of the right decisions and moved some of the stuff up. But I, with the needs to build out um, such a navy, and a navy larger than I normally build for Germany, and especially without the idea of having all of Europe's um, ICs, including Soviet ICs, um, I don't know how many, you know, proper tank divisions. I, Japan would be able to even build. Not that I won't build some, because I already think we have a few. Yeah, we have a few. You know, this is a tank unit. Um, it has light armor. Um, that's the smaller battalion size thing. No, it can get a little bigger, so yeah. But we'll have some, but we'll see. Okay, long time, lots of talk. Sorry about that, but I sort of wanted to again sort of look forward into what we are looking at doing uh, we would give the money exchange for rare materials okay um, yes communist China no South Africa mm. no we now started to get our imports from before but I let the Saudi stuff go through mainly because I want good relations with Saudi Arabia for the Axis. Let's speed this up a little bit. Okay, and we now have a few ships. We're one ship. The only is specialist training, which I'm not going to at the moment. I may do later, but... And we have most of the areas well, that could use a little more um, okay there's some cab divisions up here or regiments they're good at suppressing trying to put um, Revolt risk suppressing units on top of all of my resources out here, and we've got that fairly well taken care of. Um, we would give them now. I'm going to store up my crude oil um, on the mainland, but we are still having a fair amount of revolt risk in some of our areas in Japan where we have ICs and resources. That is why I am building right now just three, but still three um, Kempi Thai um, divisions, military police. Japan is an interesting country, and in, and in looking at it. Um, as time goes on, they become more and more of a police state. But they never at home have um, sort of the large um, concentration cap kinds of things for any groups of people. There are definitely assassinations going on. Um, some are very much um, unsanctioned by officialdom, uh, meaning that they're done maybe by mostly military um, but they're not done as part of a state program more as and there were a bunch of these and there's probably some that we'll never know about but there were a bunch of secret societies inside the military now of course amount to be a society probably three or more people um, and 
you know, so it doesn't necessarily, necessarily take a lot of um, people to um, be, you know, to form a secret society and be in one, or you know, to have them there. But um, but the military was riddled with them. So, um, and some were, um, sort of maybe not well known of, um, who exactly were the members and some of the, most of them weren't organized or controlled by the higher ups. At least that's our, our understanding of that. But they often sort of, or at least a few of the higher ups, and I'm talking just, I'm not just talking like, I'm not talking like government minister types, I'm talking more. Okay, Germany wants us to be in their faction. We would give them money for fuel. No, thank you. Um, but I'm just talking just generals and admirals, which there's lots. You know, every single division theoretically has a, a general of some sort in charge of it. Um, those are sort of the higher ups, the the generals and the colonels. Some of them sort of knew that sort of what was going on, and I think tacitly approved of what was going on. But it was very much like, well, these are not policy, not not a set approval thing. They just personally approved, and sort of let the the lower and mid level officer ranks do things. And so if everything goes bad, well then those lower and mid rank people are going to suffer for it. Um, and if it um, goes well, well, then it helps the nation out. You know, everybody benefits kind of thing as they um, would see it. And so that's what I'm talking about is that these aren't necessarily um, approved of by the overall military hier hierarchy or approved of by the government hierarchy, but they are often people working for the government doing these things so there was um assassinations and those were mostly the assassinations at least were of government and military and um naval personnel they weren't your average citizens what they did do a lot of and and i'm sure i'll be talking about more about this as the war comes on um with the the western allies um, that's there's sort of the war in China, shall we say, which depends on how you want to define it. Could it be starting in 31 with the um, invasion of um, Manchuria, or it could be what, um, is it 37, I think, is the Marco Polo Bridge incident. But that the Marco Polo Bridge incident was just um, one minor little thing in which there are hundreds, if not thousands, of ongoing incidences along the um, Japanese-held possession borders, often by um, the Manchukuo military, even the Meijing, or this other sort of because actually, sort of Manchukuo, Meijing, and this was a Chinese puppet sort of state government thing down here. Um, that was set up that eventually morphs into the reorganized nationalist China eventually as time goes on their flag changes two or three times during the, the period um, so the war generally speaking when I'm talking the war because this is sort of an ongoing constant um, uh, thing and since that sort of state um, is, like I say, is there's constant skirmishes. It's not necessarily constant um, massive aggression like the, you know, post-37 big thing. But once you start getting into the, the real big war, then you're getting more and more of a police state in Japan. And mostly what they're doing is... Um, uh, arresting people, the Kempetai are arresting people, keeping them um, uh, for some time and then releasing them. Now I could add in, and it depends on who they are, beating them. But I don't know if that is, you know, that you go in for police interrogation and you get brutally beaten 
by them, if that is a thing to be considered um, as influential or significant. And you may be going, what? That's a human rights violation. You're pulled into the, um, the police and they just start beating you without even charging you with a crime. Well, yeah, but you got to understand Japan at the time. You're going into, um, uh, um, oh, um, I think it starts with an E if we spell it in my version of understanding Japan. The, um, uh, the, um, Eta, no, yeah, the Etajima, I believe. That's sort of the main, um, naval academy. They beat, brutally beat all of, and this is the, the naval academy. This is equivalent of Annapolis, um, in America. They brutally beat all of the um, uh, first-year students. And I mean to the point that breaking bones, and then you would be sent back a year. And um, daily have, you know, an upperclassman would, um, why didn't you salute? I didn't see you. Well, and they just literally start pounding them with their fists. And, uh, you know, I'm talking black eyes and beating them and, and they're, you know, just in bad shape going through this uh, types of things. And they were incredibly brutal to, to their officer corps. This is part of the reason why the, the Japanese do so badly in World War II is that their officer corps is um, just made so compliant by this and this is just talking in the navy it was worse in the army and um made so compliant um, by all these beatings and these are the the elites of society and this but this is also from because i um read um japanese destroyer um captain is the name of the book by um captain hara uh, who survives the war, obviously, and writes, I think it was written 19, I think it was published in 1954. Um, and he talks about all this and his beatings and whatever else. And he had gone, he descended from samurai um, and gone through a different sort of local school system that didn't beat its um, uh, students. And that was just happened to be the one, because this is not because he was samurai, not because of that, stuff, just for some reason his didn't. All these other um, Etajima uh, students coming in were already expecting this. This was a shock to him, but all these other ones were already um, accepting this. And sort of the only way out of the beatings is to commit suicide. Because to have gotten accepted into school and then quit or be dismissed from the school is going to bring such great shame on your family. You might as well just commit suicide. So... Um, this is just such a brutal system. And so the school system, my understanding is, starting at a, some ages anyways, has a significant level of beating. And often, not just like with a, you know, caning or hitting them with a, a you know, a, um, a thing that stings and marks the skin, but real sort of clubs might be a bit harsh, hard um, to find, but thick, you know, quarter inch, or something, um, quarter of an inch or half inch or something, wooden um, rods kind of stuff that you're being beat with. Sort of like a fascisti, you know, if you know those, you know, all those things that they bundle together to make the fascisti um, bundle. Beating them like this at all the time. And so this is going on in Japanese society anyways. It's a very brutalized society. So that the idea that you're pulled into the police and beat for a while... It's just like, hey, it was, you know, Saturday night at school. We were beaten, you know. They lined us up and beat us kind of thing. Literally, that was often what was going on. Um, so, yeah, um, often beaten. Not always, but, um, you know, hauled into the police. And then released within a day or two, often, you know, back into society. Now, at one point um, leading up to the war with the Allies, but before then... Um, one um, newspaper editor um, says some bad things about, forget about the Japanese army. And I don't know if it was over Nanking. I don't think it was Nanking, but it was something, um, said something sort of bad. So the Japanese army sends its airplanes in and bombs the, um, uh, or some of the, you know, some of the, the Japanese army airplanes, because we'll, we'll get more into this. There's the 
Army's Air Force and there's the Navy's Air Force. There is no idea of an Air Force in Japan. In the U.S. during World War II up until after World War II, it is the U.S. Army Air Force or the U.S. Army Air Forces, however you want to say it, but they were much more of an independent um, type of thing, and we'll, we will get into this some more. But in Japan, there was the Army, there was the Navy. They both had air forces, including fighter types for Japan that couldn't, had no, like, um, uh, you know, tail hooks to catch, um, and they, were, they weren't fighters that were never designed to go on carriers. Uh, part of that was leading up to better designs. Part of that was just simply they needed more aircraft. Um, so we're not talking like, like big um, float planes like the U.S. Navy had. We're talking fighter types that were ground-based. And um, so that both had their independent air forces. Both had ground forces. I There were definitely elite units that were, you know, that were um, naval infantry that might be considered Marines. And because of several things, I would sort of, in some ways, categorize them as Marines compared to the U.S. Army, and we'll get into some of that in more detail every time because I don't want to do the, all this episode. But a lot of it might just come down to um, naval infantry. Basically, infantry that's owned by the army I mean, sorry, ah, infantry that's owned by the navy that you know they were recruited by the navy they're in the navy they've never touched you know they've never been in the army they've always been in the navy but they're not like in some nations they're not sailors that are given guns these are infantry troops and that have maybe a little bit of the um, amphibious warfare training but not necessarily much and so um the Navy has its own ground forces. Obviously, the Army has a lot of ground forces. The one thing the Army really doesn't have is any sort of um, naval-type forces. I'm sure they had some boats for some of these rivers, you know, uh, and I don't know how. And I, I definitely know um, in the coastal regions, you know, and I mean by coastal because a lot of these rivers um, that had even like during 36, 37, 38, 39, U.S. Navy, naval vessels patrolling up here. These are navigable rivers. So Japan, Japanese Navy, I think does have a few gunboats in China leading up to um, before the war. Once the war with China goes on, they, they can't operate anymore because they'd be attacked by the Chinese um, armed forces. But most of the naval operations are going on, um, are, are, are coastal. The sort of the Shanghai invasion, which happens, oh, 34, 32, I'm sort of, um, is a naval affair that goes badly, and they have to send in um, the army to, to be able to deal with, um, dealing with that, sh that sh Shanghai affair. So, um, and so I'm, but like I say, I'm sure that the, the army, just because there's so many rivers and whatnot, had, had some of their own boats, but not really a navy. Okay, the second London Naval Treaty. Um, that is sort of the standard picture of the second London Naval Treaty. I don't know why it's specifically sepia toned and looks sort of odd, but yeah, that is the picture. Okay, the treaty limited the maximum size of signatory ships and the maximum caliber of guns which they could carry. First of all, the capital ships were restricted to 35 long tons, um, 36 tons, standard displacement. And yeah, this is one thing you have to understand with ships. It's not how long they are or how wide they are. It's you know, to, to limit their size, it's how much water they displaced. And a lot, or most of the navies are lying about their ships. Um, partially that is not necessarily to keep them from building bigger ships, but how thick the armor is. So you can build a smaller ship with really thick armor, or you build a bigger ship with thinner armor, that is part of the calculus here. And for um, some of the U.S. ships that are built, 
I think more for the Washington Treaty, which is back in the 2024, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. That's just a guess. Um, some of the U.S. US production is a complete and total lie um, for their displacement. Now, they would show the calculations to anybody out there in the world that, you know, here's the shape of our hole, here's um, how much water they're displacing, and yes, they meet the tonnage limitations. Yeah, but um, they wouldn't fully fill up the um, fuel bunkers on the ships because that would sink the ship a little bit more. And they would only put about a um, third of the ammunition capacity on board the ships because that was third of the peacetime. Oh, you could war load it with more. Meaning if you fully fueled it up, fully put on more stores, they'd also keep, you know, how long stores are, um, you know, supplies. You know, how much food would you have on board the ship for how long you could be out there? How much water would you store on board the ship? They would keep all of that down to sort of peacetime, constantly keep it down, and only put about a third of the at least main gun ammunition on the, the ships at any one time and so to meet the um, max requirements of the Washington, I think the Washington Naval Treaty, and so to build ships. And so, of course, if they were to go to war, they would then fully put on, put all the fuel on, fully supply the vessel up and fully arm the magazines. And then, of course, it would be over the treaty limit, not maybe in a major way. Let's say theoretically the, the Washington Naval Treaty, I don't remember, I don't know what it is. But um, would be 36 tons. Eh, this vessel, if loaded up, it might be 38, 39 tons, kind of thing. You know, it's it's not, or a thousand tons or whatever. But you know what I mean. It's not quite the situation that it's like half as weight as it would be or anything like that. But they were cheating, and that was just the U.S. that I know of. Of course, Germany um, cheats with its um, Panzer Shift. The uh, you know the um, uh, pocket battleships. Those are, are most all of those vessels are claimed to be within limitations, and they're just they're even worse of a cheat. Um, okay. Also, submarines could not be larger than two thousand tons, or have any gun armament greater than the five point one inches light cruisers. Now there is, I know, in all of these things regarding the um, submarines, the exception for the Sukhuf. That's the big French. Um, vessel that was much earlier and was exempted in the Washington Naval and continued to be exempted. But they couldn't build more. They could have that one for France kind of thing. Like cruisers were restricted to 8,000 tons, 6.1 inch armament, and aircraft carriers were restricted to 23,000 tons. Now, um, way back in developing, and trust me, I didn't, didn't always know what I know now, of course, but um, in developing TRE, I came across a medal that commemorated um, Japan and the Second London Naval Treaty. And the medal commemorated Japan walking out and not signing the Second London Naval Treaty. So um, I use a different version, but this you know, based on this picture and that medal for a sort of notification that Japan doesn't sign. So we can sign the treaty, which will improve our relations, but give us more dissent and lose national unity, or we gain, um, or we piss them off and gain this, or lose dissent and gain national unity. Now, there are various factions. Now, this basically only affects the Navy, not the Army. But they're, um, unlike in, say, most modern Western countries, a lot of the press, most of the press, is right-wing supranationalistic. Uh, so the press would be very pissed off. And this goes back to partially the Washington Naval Treaty, um, but it goes sort of back to the Russo-Japanese War and the, the treaty that splits Sakhalin Island between the Russian Empire and um, Japan. And so th there are two factions within the Navy. One wants to protect Japan, wants to grow the Japanese Empire because it feels um, or it understands or it believes to be a first-class world nation, industrialized nation, you need an empire to do so. 
We know that is not the case today because we can see that Japan is a first class industrialized nation, a technically developed nation, and it has no empire, even though it still has no resources of which to make those things. So um, we know that is a fallacy in thinking, but it was the thinking at the time for most of them. They would look at the U.S. and go, well, yeah, you're not maybe really an empire, but you're just a big continental power kind of thing, or the similar with the Soviet Union. You could argue that the U.S. is 50 states slash nations empire, empire to one. Well, at this time, it's 48. Um, Alaska and Hawaii were still just possessions uh, during World War II and before. So, um, Yamamoto was um, a party of the, the treaty faction because... Brit or Japan had a long, long history of being a British ally. Um, it was more or less a British ally in Asia, including dealings with Japan or China. Um, the Russo-Japanese War is seen to a minor degree an extension of the. Um, uh, British slash Russian Empire imperial conflict. Of course, that breaks out in the you know the Crimean War much earlier, and there's ongoing um, you know the Great Game in India, you know, over Afghanistan and these other places. You know, where is this Russian sphere of influence? Where is the British sphere of influence? Japan sort of buys in to being uh, you know at various stages um, an ally of Britain. So it expects or wants or believes that Britain is going to allow Japanese expansion, which Britain, of course, does, particularly against German possessions. All of Basically, all of these islands out here were German possessions at the start of World War I. And um, although they don't, um, doesn't get um, German Quang Dao or whatever it was called here, other German sort of um, possessions. It doesn't get those. Um, does allow it, of course, to get Port Arthur from the Russians and stuff. So it, it, you know, Britain is sort of like, yeah, so long as you're not taking away our pieces of the pie, which include um, not just like direct owned possessions like um, Hong Kong, but um, large sections, and I don't, you can look up a map for it, don't know where they were, but large sections of China were sort of divided up between France, originally Germany a little bit, um, France, Britain, and Japan as sort of economic sections in that um, they didn't have any real political or control, but they could force the locals to make sure that their goods were being sold in that region whatever the locals cared about. It doesn't mean that the locals had to buy Japanese goods or British goods, but they had to be allowed to be sold in those regions. And those regions were sort of exclusive, meaning um, only French goods were sold in the French regions, only British goods sold in the British regions, and only Japanese goods sold, sold in the Japanese regions. Of course, the U.S. had a massive conflict with this. They agreed with the um, the overall sentiment of... China must allow, whether China wanted to allow or, or not, China must allow foreign goods to be sold in China. Again, Chinese didn't have to buy the goods, but they must allow foreign goods. But the U.S. wanted the open door policy in which everyone gets to compete everywhere because America's into free markets as opposed to mercantile markets. Mercantilism does have market forces in it, but it is trying to like limit who gets to sell or buy or whatever in certain regions. The U.S. said, hey, yeah, we're, we want everybody to compete. You know, Chinese goods can be sold there and everybody else's goods. You know, just that was um, the U.S.'s push was. And it wasn't just because the U.S. was sort of a late power to this and it couldn't grab up a region. To the best of my knowledge, it never by legal limits um, uh, uh, 
limit foreign goods to being sold in various territories like the Philippines or whatever. If a British company wanted to come in and sell widgets or radios or whatever it might be, yeah, you can set up a store and try to sell them. Whether anybody will buy them or not, you know, is up to the people. That's always been the sort of U.S. Um, th uh, theory in practice. So, um, the treaty faction of the Japanese Navy, and they're the ones that are um, most worried about Britain because obviously Britain doesn't have much of a land empire and is probably not really going to be the one fighting the army. It's going to be the Navy. They want to um, parallel and partner with the British. Do whatever they can to expand and grow, but don't um, go against the British. The other thing is, is in, in a reading up on um, Japan, Japan realized and developed its navy to fight the United States Navy. That was its expected partially because of its this alliance with Britain. But the main threat was the U.S. Navy. And this goes back to before the turn of the century, actually before the war with uh, the Russians. There are various things that piss off the Japanese, including a, not a, if I'm remembering this correctly, not a national law, but a local California law limiting Japanese migration into um, California, specifically by Japanese, and not necessarily, or it may have been all Asians, but it was focused on Japan. There were lots of Japanese migrating, well, there was a fair number going to, to um, California, that's why the local Californians. California used to be a, um, a uh, anti-immigration state um, for the longest time. Even back, if you look at Cesar Chavez, which is a hero in California, he was, even though he's Hispanic, as you could probably tell the name, vehemently against um, Mexican immigration to, to the U.S. because he was a unionist, a union guy. Unionists, union guys, they want to protect the wages for the unions and know that large amounts of um, uh, foreign labor coming in reduces um, the value of union labor. Um, this has since changed, but California had been, and this, so this goes well back before Reagan ever becomes governor, but California had long been a, an anti-immigration state for various reasons. Um, and a, um, some of it is definitely racial um, views at the time, but it's not always um, because, like I say, Cesar Chavez was very much a, a Mexican-American. It wasn't because he didn't like Mexican people. It was because he was protecting union worker rights. Those are, you know, a, that's where his thing was. So... Um, you know, things like that did piss the Japanese off because the Japanese press made a lot out of it. But then you have ooh, uh, uh, 32, the major Japanese earthquake in which the U.S. sends massive amounts of aid to Japan, um, or at least relative massive amounts of aid to Japan because of the earthquake that happened. So that, you know, there are, it's not, and the Japanese Navy doesn't see that America is like the enemy. They just don't see who else it would be because, you know, as, as a Navy, because they, it wasn't going to be Austria or even Austria-Hungary. You know, it wasn't going to be Italy. It wasn't going to be Sweden. You know, um, there was the British Empire, but like I say, they had seen them up until about this time period, up until mid second half of, of 1930s, they saw Britain primarily as their main greater international ally. And so they weren't planning on developing a navy that was to fight the British Navy. They were planning, and so who might it be that we would fight? Again, it wasn't going to be Brazil. It wasn't going to be um, 
you know, Chile. Not that if they didn't go to war with them, there wouldn't be the Japanese Navy going out there and fighting them. They just weren't a threat to Japan and weren't likely to be the nation that was going to attack Japan. It was the U.S. But seeing all of this and looking at the U.S. as the likely major threat to it, they saw that that was a dangerous quite possibly a war-losing threat. So the treaty faction within the Japanese Navy, in which the, the one name that I prominently know and you know is um, Admiral Yamamoto, he is for the treaties. He is for not pissing off America and not pissing off Britain. You know, you want to go to war with the Soviet Union? Go ahead. We'll we'll do the Navy bits and, you know, help with the landings and, you know, bomb and whatever. And you Army guys can go fight the, the Soviets. We'll, we'll do, you know. The Navy's up for that. Um, the Navy, yeah. If, you, if that's national, you know. Obviously, if Japan's attacked... The Navy's going to respond. But you want to do some, you know, international foreign adventurism? Fine. We're on board with it. Just don't make it Britain or America. Okay. So the, um, that's the, the, the treaty faction. Of course, within the, the Navy, there's the anti-treaty faction. The anti-treaty faction wins. Now, we're going to do the anti-treaty faction for a couple of reasons. One, we could gain some more national unity here. And we, obviously, we don't have any current dissent, but um, we don't need foreign dissent. And all things considered, right now, I'm not really worried about pissing those countries off that much. So, um, we've already left... Also remember at this point, we've already left the um, the League of Nations over the um, uh, issue of Manchukuo. So we've already left that. And let's save this. And that worked just fine. Okay, we're going to end the episode here. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Thanks for liking the videos. If you haven't already and you made it this far, you should subscribe to the channel. Love to see you around more often. And, of course, please post comments, corrections, questions, suggestions, tips, and more corrections. Because, like, I'm throwing out some dates. If anybody cares enough, Google it. And you can put links to, you know, Wikipedia. I'm happy with that on any of these topics. I just don't have the time to go in um, and do those kind of things. But I really sort of hope this to be an educational thing. So if anybody wants to take it on to themselves to post corrections, more details, and particular links to Wikipedia, I would be happy for that so people can easily look up more details on all of these topics. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.